Woohoo! All right, here we go. So, welcome everybody um, to the fourth CA4AA Fundamentals webinar, What We've Learned from History. We've got Professor Dr. Stephen Duncombe. Yes, look, I'm wearing the tweed. I've got not quite a pipe, but it will suffice for today. <laughs> and um, our manager, Rebecca Bray, formerly known as the Mask Joe Hill. Hey, how's it going? So Rebecca is going to be um, monitoring questions. So if you post like a question in the chat, she'll if she can answer it immediately, she will, or she'll save it for the end. Um, and so we'll bring her back, but you can hang out just for a minute. Um, and uh, what we're going to do today is talk about history. Steve, oh, that's what we yeah, is is uh, has done a lot of research on history. Why did we start doing this? Do you remember? Well, we, we started doing it because there was this perception that creative activism, artistic activism was this new thing, right? And it's yeah. like, oh, everybody's talking about it. It's something new. And uh, we were like, uh, I don't think it is new. And one of, you know, and my other hat I wear, I'm a college professor, and I was trained by a historian. And I kept looking back in history and being like, no. People have been doing this for a long time. Um, and so we kind of started putting it into our slideshows and started putting it into our workshops, and here we are now. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's why we started doing history. Great. So that's what we're going to talk about today um, in a few minutes, but just to cover some of the uh, technical stuff, there is a chat window for you. Rebecca will be monitoring that chat. And um, if you have a question, put that in. We'll have time for questions at the end. Another note is that this is being recorded, so um, if you have trouble connecting or something, um, we will be posting the recording later. You'll also get an email to it um, at the end. We'll talk about some of those details at the end. Um, so that can take away some of that anxiety. And um, we were going to talk about some questions uh, that we had from previous things. So Rebecca, thank you. We'll, we'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, see you later. Okay. Yeah, we wanted to some great questions have come up that we haven't been able to answer actually online and then sometimes also we run into people um, who have seen the webinar and they're like oh you know I had this question I'm like oh that would have been a great question to talk about um, so we have a lot of questions but there's two questions that came up which we thought were worth sharing so one um, was I guess I'll do this one first someone asked I think this was two webinars ago but um, you guys are like two white college professors um, and you're in the leadership position in these movements, you know, how, how do you navigate that? And this is a question I think that comes up for a lot of us that um, uh, all white different white kinds of people, professor. sorry? Especially the white male college professor. Yeah. But, um, but how do you uh, become part of or help with a movement that you're in some way not actually a part of? Yeah. Uh, and it, it's a great question. Um, one of the ways to think about it, and this is the way that we think about it, because we've given this a lot of thought, given our obvious subject positions, um, is that we actually look at what we do as service to a movement. And we actually consciously don't take leadership, but go into situations, position ourselves in situations, so people are asking us what they want. Um, and we're delivering to them, or rather, we're delivering to them what they want and they're asking us and so when we go in and work with organizations it's that we've actually been asked to go into organizations to do specific things um, and those specific things aren't about telling folks what to do they're not about actually organizing they're not actually leaders um, we actually look at ourselves as uh, in some ways and this is one of the roles we play uh, we're carpenters, um, and we actually do work as carpenters, um, and we build stuff for people. But we think about that in sort of a more general sense, too. It's like we've done a lot of studies on artistic activism. We have a lot of practice in artistic activism. We can bring that into the room to share. What people do with that is really up to them, and whether they find it useful or not is up to them. But we'd never go into a situation and say, you've got to do this. This is the only thing that's going to work, and it will change your movement. because. A, we have no right to do that, and B, you know, you can't walk into a place where people actually don't want you to be. What do you, what do you have to do? Uh, 
to you. I, I think um, the, a way to think about it is that we all have different kinds of expertise. And so um, uh, think about it as like, hey, I have this expertise to offer if it's useful, not to impose, but to offer, right? And, um, and there's a lot of other rules of thumb. I mean, we could make a whole other um, thing about how you collaborate. We probably will, actually. Um, but, you know, not to impose things, not to come in, but to, like, to be a good listener, how to be a good collaborator. Um, but a big part of it is, like, offering instead of imposing. So, uh, and, and I think also, just go back to this idea, collaboration is always more useful than leadership. The world probably has too many leaders, actually, and it has less... Uh, collaborators and so one of the skills we have to learn is really how to work with one another and listen to one another about what people want what they need and how we can actually help each other uh, one of the things that we always say in our workshops is we know it's been successful when we don't completely understand the final product the final project we do because that means that actually we haven't been leaders that we've actually the leadership's been taken away and moved to someplace else and that people have used those uh, techniques that we have, the, the skills that we have, the knowledge that we have, but made it entirely their own. Yeah, just... I think thinking about it as like, you know, there's an expertise that we have that we have to offer and that everyone has and that that combined expertise is, and when you collaborate, the different experience that people have actually it becomes a strength. Um, so the other question that you got was yeah. about... Um, yeah, I'll tell you about that. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, I have, a, I have a good friend named Marlene, who is this really kick-ass organizer, activist, experienced creative activist. And we were at uh, some party a couple of days ago. And she said, you know, I've been watching the webinars, really been loving them, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then she's like, and uh, I think you guys are being too harsh on, like, raising awareness and creating conversations. And she made this really... I thought brilliant point about that in some instances, in some cases, that creating, you know, raising awareness and creating conversations actually can be a worthy objective. So, what do you think about that, Steve? I blamed it all on you. I said, I, well, I really had nothing to do with that. But this, yeah, uh, and, and I will take the blame. I, I think, um, I still think raising awareness and, and uh, starting a conversation is, uh, it's like the first step, right? So it might be a very critical first step, and it, the, my, there's projects I've done, like specifically around the, the capitalism works for me, true false sign. So much of it is about conversation and understanding. Um, but I, I know that that's the first step towards getting to a world that I want. And I have an idea of where I want it to go from there. And so, um, so it's not to say that raising awareness and starting a conversation isn't important, it's just, needs to be seen within the uh, within a context of where it fits in a bigger picture, right? So it's only important in that it leads to change, uh, behavioral change, policy change, right? Like we're working towards something um, when, uh, yeah, a good meaning is only a good meaning, right? But well, I, I think Marlene would say um, that actually what we do is we privilege things like policy and material change too much. And that actually those forms of interpersonal change and consciousness change and the idea of different subjectivities is super, super important. I, I agree. And if you're fine with just doing that and not changing policy and not changing people's behavior, then great. But if you do, in fact, want to do more, then you need to like be honest with yourself about what you're actually trying to achieve and, and really look at that. Yeah, I'm not thoroughly convinced, Steve. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let Marlene talk to you about this. Right. <laughs> I think enough people are on right now, so I think yeah. we can begin. Um, so again, for those people that just joined, um, what we're gonna be talking about today in the C4AA fundamentals is what we've learned from history, uh, and we believe history is super super important. Um, it's important for all those reasons your history professor and teacher in high school told you about that. Those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Um, and it's also important because one of the things that we can actually learn from history is not how to repeat things, but actually how to learn how things work differently or work in different contexts and how we can actually change history and do things quite differently. Um, and so 
one of the ways we've tried to think about artistic activism is not something which has just been happening in the past 10 or 15 years, but is essentially part of all creative activism, and creativity is part of all effective activism. Because if you go back in history and you look at social movements, whether they take the guise of political movements or religious movements or what have you, you start to understand that things like aesthetics and storytelling and spectacle and signs and symbols are an integral part to all of those sorts of histories. So when we usually do this, um, you know, we talk about a whole range. And if we talked about a whole range of histories, we would be here forever. Um, and so in our workshops, we do talk about a range of, uh, of uh, different ways of looking at history and, and sort of teasing out what are the creative components of it. But there's no way we could even look at this um, today, uh, and particularly not in 30 minutes. So what we're going to do is we're going to go right to the middle of this list and pick a movement that a lot of people are familiar with and try to get us to look at it through a different lens. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the Civil Rights Movement. Um, if we have time, we'll get to Black, Brown, and Red Power. And if we have a lot of time, we'll get to ACT UP at the end to sort of bring this up more to the present. Um, ready to begin, Steve? I'm ready. Yeah, let's go. All right. Let's do it. First, we're going to start with the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, which arguably is one of the most successful um, social change campaigns in U.S. history. Um, Steve? Still oh, sorry? No, just saying still happening, too. Yeah, yes, it is still happening. But uh, um, a lot of progress made. Um, from the mid-1950s and earlier, if you want to count the Communist Party and core organizing in previous decades to the late 60s, um, it involved tens of thousands of people and changed civil rights for millions. And it was also, uh, and a lot of people don't realize this because it's sort of been, it has been historicized, but it's a consciously creative campaign. So we often think of the civil rights movement as, you know, in terms of this image, the sort of shining star of courage and righteousness, Martin, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and, and King was a brave and righteous individual, no doubt. Uh, but his and the movement's uh, power and efficacy was more communal and cultural than is often recognized um, when, it, when it's talked about uh, today. Yeah. Go to the next slide, Steve. You got it. Well, we're in different houses today, so it's a little, a little rougher. Um, and this is the particular community that Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s came out of, which was the black churches. Um, and this is important to think about because what the black churches offered was not only a material place and space that one, civil rights organizing could happen, but it also offered the cultural foundations and the cultural space in which one could imagine freedom in a political society. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that the religious stories and songs and, uh, and myths that the Civil Rights Movement drew upon were not created out of whole cloth, um, but instead went back to those stories that people had been telling themselves in black churches for generations and generations and generations. Stories like the Israelites rebelling against the Pharaoh and finding their way to freedom in the promised land. That becomes a central metaphor for the way that African Americans can imagine freedom. It becomes a sort of cultural bedrock, a familiar story by which then they can actually journey into the unfamiliar territory of political work. Um, it makes it comfortable. It makes it so a political organizer can talk to someone who has no sense of politics but has a deep tradition in the church and says, yeah, just like Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, that's what we're going to do. We're going to drown the pharaoh as well. <laughs> so, that that part, but. <laughs> so that lesson here, uh, or one of them, is to build from cultural foundations. And often, as activists, you know, it's a mistake to think that we need to start create something from nothing. And we're always drawing from pre-existing cultures and the meanings and images and words that already exist. Like we we are born into a cultural context. Um, this also is what makes changing society so hard, is that we're stuck within the very reality that we're trying to change, and it's very hard to envision anything outside of it. But even within the most oppressive societies, there are pockets of these countercultures. Um, Steve calls it repositories of resistance that provide the, uh, 
provide a cultural sort of foundation, whether that's stories or songs, cultural institutions, comedy, um, uh, an aesthetic, whatever it is, then we can build upon and we can access. So we don't have to start from nothing. So, okay. uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. You can do the transition. Okay. So um, another sort of icon of the civil rights movement is uh, Rosa Parks. And, yeah. you know, we know the story. I was taught it in elementary school that, um, you know, this woman, Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama, she was a seamstress. She was tired after a long day of work. And then one day she just decided she was going to give up her seat to, uh, or she wasn't going to give up her seat to a white person and move to the back of the segregated bus. And that was this thing that kicked off the whole civil rights movement. And it's a great story. And it's a great story. Um, and it's a story which actually the civil rights movement uh, cultivated and helped groom. And it was a, by and large, fabricated story. Um, that is, Rosa Parks was not just some tired seamstress. She was the local secretary of the NAACP. She had grown up in a political family. She had done work with the Scottsboro Boys and the Communist Party in the 1930s. She had been trained at the Highlander Institute, which was a cultural and political institute um, uh, in the South. That is, she was a seasoned political activist. And she was a seamstress, and I'm sure she was tired that day. Um, but uh, when she decided not to give up her seat, she did it as a conscious political symbol, understanding that the weight and the power of the civil rights establishment was behind her. Um, Steve, do you want to go to the next picture? Yeah, you're seeing the slides, right? No, not seeing the slides. Seeing some weird, wacky stuff. In fact, oh my God, they're oh. seeing, looking at our notes. They're not. They're gonna realize that we're just reading notes. That's, is that better? No, that's not good. Better. Was but it working well, before? Yeah, it was working before. Now it's just getting crazy. There we go. Okay, so the next slide. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is another image of uh, that Rosa Parks. Yeah, it's the wide shot. And yeah. So the question is, Steve, who is that white guy in the back? Well, this is what I always thought, right? I'd seen this picture, and that's the guy that she said, I'm not giving up the seat. And he was like, okay, fine. I'm going to sit here then and stew and be angry. Right. And, um, and then, and this is the part that when you think about it, it doesn't make sense. Right. But, but it makes for a good picture, right? Yeah, it's a great picture. But, uh, but, but like, so this guy doesn't give up his seat, and then he sits down. And then who calls the press, right? And it's like, hey, can you get over here? There's this, this woman that won't give up her seat on the bus. And then the guy hangs out, and the press comes, and they stop the bus, and they're like, let's take a picture. Like, and the, and the, and the, the racist guy that's like trying to get somewhere on the bus is like, yeah, yeah, I'll hang out. Sure, sure. You want me to sit this way? <laughs> so I can clear it up for you, Steve. OK, so who that guy is is he's a reporter, OK? Um, he's a reporter that the photographer asked if he would be in the picture in order to create a contrast to make a good photo. So he and, was like another AP guy, and they're yeah, like, you're a white guy for context, will you just go and sit down there for a second? Right. And not only that, but when do you think this photo was taken? Because like you said, it probably didn't happen at that moment. Uh, well, you've told me before, so I know that it took over, it was a, over a year later. It was exactly a year later. It was on the year anniversary. It was the uh, day after the Supreme Court ruled uh, that the bu that Montgomery bus system was illegal. Yeah. They needed a photo for the news. And so this iconic photo was staged. And Rosa Parks actually get, not giving up her seat was a performative act. And so what's the takeaway from this, Steve? Well, what it says in our slides is perform reality, right? Yeah, there you go. Let's explain and, it. This, um, I think we got to be really clear here. We're not saying that, like often when your uh, performance is a fiction, this is not a performance of a fiction. This really happened. Rosa Parks really was a seamstress. She really was tired of giving up her seat, right? But there was a, another part of it. Uh, there, 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 there were other parts of that reality. She was an organizer. She was a trained organizer. She came from a whole family of anti-racist organizers. Um, and so the, but the performance was of that reality. It was something that happened all the time in Montgomery, but there were no reporters to take the picture. And so this, uh, this photograph is a performance, but it's not a performance of fiction. It's a performance of reality. Yeah. Well put.
All right. Anything else we need to say about that one? No, I think it'll come up in the next next slides. Yeah. The idea here is like there's the truth, but the truth needs help. It needs a picture. It needs an image for the news. It needs a story, right? And they created that image and they created that story. So these are other iconic images of uh, the civil rights movement. And these, yeah, and, and these are photos from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which is Martin Luther King's organization's campaign to desegregate Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. And they should be familiar photos. They were photos that were taken and then broadcast across the entire world. And this set of photos, in many ways, was so shocking and so embarrassing for the U.S. government because it was being used in a propaganda campaign around the world to show that the United States, this beacon of freedom, actually wasn't so free after all, that within one year, the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. And that's not to say that this is what led to the Civil Rights Act being uh, uh, passed. Um, because there was lots of legal strategies and political strategies, but it certainly was one of the things that helped, was these images. Now, the key here, and I'll let Steve jump in here, is that these photos in many ways were staged. And I don't yeah. mean staged insofar as they didn't happen. I mean that a year earlier, the SCLC created or staged or performed a different, planned. what? Planned, yeah. exactly. Planned um, a uh, desegregation of a city in Georgia, and it was a miserable failure. It was a miserable failure because the sheriff of that town basically arrested people really quietly, put them in jails all over Georgia, and let them out five days later after the press had left. And so King and his lieutenants went back after that failure, and they said, well, what are we going to do? And they picked Birmingham, Alabama, partly because it had a long history of civil rights movement, a long history of racial violence, but by and large, it was picked for this guy on the left of your screen, Bull Connor. Yeah. So Steve, done some work on Bull Connor. So who was Bull Connor? Bull Connor was the public safety officer in Birmingham. And it's sort of convoluted, but he was basically like a lame duck. Like he had been voted out. Um, he also was a former member of the Klan and just like an outright racist um, that had been in public government for decades. With nothing to lose because he didn't have to win another election. Yeah. And so the plan was to go to Birmingham, stage this action again, and, and uh, anticipating that unlike the sheriff in Georgia, right? Uh, Georgia, right? Yeah, Georgia. Um, wouldn't react in this sort of calmly and just put them in jail, but would overreact. And in fact, he did, you know. So he, he brought his fire department people and turned hoses and arrested children, right? And they made sure that the press was there. And this was a, a pretty contro controversial move at the time, like as organizing strategy. There were a lot of people in the movement that were against it, of like using children and like going into a situation that they knew there would be a confrontation. You know, it's called the Children's Crusade, which was, going, again, drawing back on this idea of biblical history. Yeah. Um, but basically, they needed a villain, and they needed these images uh, uh, to tell the story, right? And, and part of the story is the villain, right? So Bull Connor just stepped right into the role. And you can see in this newspaper story, it's like, unwittingly, he and his city brought millions of people to the Negro side. Um, so at, he, by overreacting, they were able to take these pictures. Now, what happened with the pictures? The, you have to understand the other part of the context here. This is the early 60s. We are in the Cold War with the Soviet Union, right? And so the idea is we're the land, the, the, the land of freedom and possibility, right? And these images went around the world. People talked about seeing them on, in the, on the front page of the newspapers in Japan. And it was incredibly embarrassing to the United States. It also brought something out into the open and into the papers that happened, but it happened in a more invisible way. This you would be attacked in the middle of the night; people would just disappear. It was it was structural and institutional. It, it didn't it didn't wasn't photographed wasn't as obvious, right? So they made it obvious. They made it really clear. And so the takeaway here is um, making the invisible visible. Um, racism, white supremacy, white violence happened all the time. Um, but it happened in the shadows, um, and it happened in the alleys. And what the civil rights movement understood is they had to bring it out into the light to make it visible. Now, this is also true with things like structural racism 
with the environment and environmental crisis, um, endemic poverty. These are things which actually don't lend themselves very well to pictures. And so one of the things that activists can do is figure out how to take that invisible reality and stage it in such a way that it becomes visible. And again, this was a lesson we can learn from the civil rights movement. Well, there's also more lessons to learn. What else we got? Okay, so these were uh, the lunch, famous lunch counter sit-ins. I think this is in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, in 1960 was the first one. Actually, the first one happens in 1955 in Baltimore, Maryland, but the famous ones that we know of are the ones that started in the early 1960s, often led by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which are essentially students, um, college students. And what the tactic was is that um, African American men and women dressed very well would walk into a Woolworths, um, a big department store, and sit down at the whites only county counter and refused to leave unless they were served. They weren't served, they refused to let be, uh, they, they refused to leave and they were arrested and they made sure that a lot of photographers were there to watch it. But it, it didn't always look like this. Um, no. Again, it was like a similar thing. They, they sometimes planned for an overreaction. And so this would happen also. Yes, I mean, it took immense amount of discipline to sit there while you can see that mob behind you pouring stuff on you, kicking, yelling, screaming, and so Blowing on. cigarette smoke in your face. Um, and so to not overreact, they actually rehearsed this. Yeah. And these are images of those rehearsals. Yeah. They did um, advanced training as actors in, in drama programs. Um, they, they did actual rehearsals um, where they would practice having smoke blown in their face and uh, food poured on them. Um, you know, coffee and stuff splashed in their face. And there's video of this, and what's amazing is like, you know, they would practice, they would yell at each other, and then it would just go so far, they would start laughing, and then, you know, they, they would practice it again. So it was, it was all friendly um, in the rehearsals, and then they would go out and do the real thing. Right. And the takeaway here is this idea that all protest is performance. We have a friend named David Solnit. Um, who was one of the key folks in organizing the uh, Seattle protests. And he once said to us, all protest is performance. Just a lot of it's really bad performance. Um, and as any performance, protest needs rehearsals. You need to actually, you're presenting yourself out there. Um, you're being asked to do certain things in highly stressful situations. And so it makes sense to actually um, practice. And, and practice like the kind of theatrics, right? The blocking. So you're, you're, you're not upstaging somebody, knowing what your lines are when the press asks you what this is about, right? And having the best possible answer. Considering lines of sight for photographers and creating tableaus that, that make an image that will go out into the press. And this often runs counter to this idea of protest as spontaneous demonstrations of people's anger. Um, but what the civil rights movement shows us is that might be what it looked like sometimes, but in order to achieve that to maximum impact, it was practiced, it was performed, it was staged, it was thought through, and it was planned. Um, it wasn't spontaneous. Rosa Parks was not spontaneous nor were the students sitting down at Woolworth counters. They may have been angry, and I'm sure they were angry. They may have been burning with righteous justice. I'm sure they were, but they also had planned and performed and thought about what is it going to look like as a photograph? How is it going to be transmitted? And what is the message I want to convey in that photograph? I think another way to think about this, too, is that your protest is stronger when you think about this. Right? If it's just a bunch of people marching down the street, everybody's seen that before, right? Um, if you start thinking about creating a tableau, what the message is, um, what, what, the, what the reality you're trying to perform is, or, or what you're trying to show that's not often seen, um, and, and thinking in these terms, not just those, I mean, we, there, we'll, we'll cover some other things too, but thinking it through makes it more effective. It's a better use of everybody's time too. Yeah, one of the way, things that we always like to say is that think about the word demonstration and take it seriously. That is, what are you demonstrating to the world? Uh, and this always makes me think of like the uh, 
protest I went to in like San Francisco where the ultimate, you know, accomplishment was being arrested, right? And so the image was, uh, a, a great image would be you with your hands behind your back, you know, being thrown into a, a police van like, ah, you know, and, but what is that a demonstration of? Right. If you're, if, if you're arresting young children dressed in their Sunday best, then that's actually a demonstration of the brutality of the state that we take it out on these victims. If you're arresting some kid who's yelling at a cop, well, most people are actually going to side with the cop, not with a young kid. Um, and so that's just to think always about every dem Solnit said this as well. Every demonstration, you get a picture. What is the picture you want? So do we have time to actually go into the black, red, and brown power? We totally do. Totally. Okay, we're going to do this quick. Yeah. Okay, so um, as the civil rights movement moved into the late 60s, um, the rise of another aspect of black liberation came about, which was black power. Okay, And the black power organizers, most of them had come out of the civil rights movement. And they were frustrated by the slow pace, um, the legalistic premises, um, the sort of the peace and love ideology, and the idea that based in the church that the civil rights movement had. But they brought with them a lot of the lessons which they learned in the civil rights movement. And one of those lessons was about image. So here's the Black Panther Party. Berets, black leather jackets, carrying guns when they could, in military formation, and Angela Davis. You know, they were quite simply the coolest people in the room. And they were so badass. They looked so good that you just wanted to be them. And it was a uniform. It was as much a uniform as the coats and ties of the early civil rights movement. That is, it expressed, it demonstrated to the world that we are cool, we are righteous, we are powerful, and we have our own style. And we are so, dangerous, right? You know, like carrying guns. Yeah. That was part yeah. of the, the presentation, right? And so this is, a, this is a sort of more extreme version, but, and we talk about this with other examples too, but when you look at history, there is a, um, often a style element to it, right? And that the style is really important. We yeah. as activists are part of the art of activism and how we appear and how we present ourselves matters. So if you're standing really glumly behind a table and be like, will you please take my pamphlet? Um, then you, <laughs> it makes activism and what you're fighting for seem as dull as that is, right? Um, right? Whereas if you seem exciting and enlivened and hopeful, then that comes across in the message too. Yeah, and this is important. It's not about Steve wearing a dashiki, though I think it would be kind of cool if he did. No, it <laughs> but it's, it's, it's not about clothing. It's about what you project, okay? That might have something to do with clothing. It might not. But more it has to do with we are the front line of what people think about activism and what people think about the causes. We are the billboard. And so what sort of a billboard do we want to present to the people? So um, this, their, their sort of approach was a bit contagious. This is an image of the Puerto Rican young, or the Chicano yep. Brown Berets. The Brown Berets in um, Los Angeles. Yeah, and then uh, this one here is the Puerto Rican Young Lords Party uh, and the East Coast, yep. and and then also it, it influenced the American Indian Movement. Um, yeah, and this is probably our all-time favorite action ever, um, <laughs> it just because it was just so brilliant. Um, so in 1969, a group of activists, uh, American Indian activists, occupied Alcatraz Island and declared it a new Indian reservation. And they issued, in front of all the media, uh, a, uh, what is it called, a proclamation. And here's yeah. some of the proclamation. Yeah, so the island, it's important to say, was no longer oh, yeah, a prison. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, sorry. Yeah, it, it's in the middle of the bay in, in San Francisco. But it, was a, it had been a prison, and then it was decommissioned as a prison. It was just sitting there. So they went out there and took it over and then issued this proclamation. Go for it, Steve. All right. We, the Native Americans, reclaim the land known as Alcatraz Island in the name of all American Indians by right of discovery. We wish to be fair and honorable in our dealings with the Caucasian inhabitants of this land, and hereby offer the following treaty. 
we will purchase said Alcatraz Island for $24, $24, and glass beads and red cloth, a precedent set by the white man's purchase of a similar island about 300 years ago. We know that $24 in trade goods for these 16 acres is more than what was paid when Manhattan Island was sold, but we know that land values have risen over the years. And then they go on to say why this would be a perfect place. Because like Indian reservations, it is isolated from modern facilities and without adequate means of transportation. There are no educational facilities. The soil is rocky and non-productive, and the land does not support game. And the population has always been held as prisoners and kept dependent upon others. So the first thing you realize is that this is really funny, right? And if there's one group in US history that has less reason to take their current situation with anything but tragedy and anger and just rage, it's Native Americans. Yet here these Native Americans use this to be funny. So why, Steve? I think it's because uh, it, well, there's two things. When something's funny, like people want it, are more likely to share it, right? Like we like telling you about this because it is funny. Um, and it, it, so it makes a message travel further. Um, another reason is that it makes it a little bit more palatable, right? The, the, the plight of Native Americans in this country is devastating and awful. But um, when it starts with a joke, you're more likely to hang in there and listen. And there's a bunch of other reasons, too. Am I, am I not thinking of something, Steve? Well, just the idea of that jokes take two people or more in order for you to get it. It actually automatically builds some sense of community in order to get the joke, particularly a satirical joke um, or an ironic joke like these Native American activists are using. You actually get in on the joke, and so you're kind of part of it, and it builds that sort of uh, uh, a relationship, which you don't have when someone's lecturing you on a soapbox. That's their message over there. It has nothing to do with me. So, Steve, we have a lot more to do, but I want us to skip all the way to the end. We have more stuff on uh, the black, red, and brown power. We have stuff on ACT UP. We, have, we could be going for years, but I want to leave time for something at the end and also time for questions. So can we skip all the way to the end? And are you talking about the dark side? I'm talking about the dark side. There we go. Okay, here's the dark side. So, um, so we talk about acknowledge that, that, that this is not creativity. It's not always done by the best people. Um, as you may have seen in the uh, last election. Um, I, I just recently learned that Steve Bannon is, was a filmmaker first. Um, I'm, not, I'm not surprised at all. Very inspired by Lenny Riefenstahl and Michael Moore. Nice. Well, it's good to say. And that actually kind of sets us up pretty well for where we want to go with this. Because when we talk about the most creative activists of the past hundred years, the people that were able to turn creativity into real political power, it's not the Civil Rights Movement, and it's not the American Indian Movement, and it's not ACT UP, even though all of these groups were masters at the practice. But if we want to go back and pin a dubious medal on the social movement, we did this best, it would be these guys. The Nazi, the Nazi Party. The Nazi, the Nazi party. party. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. The Nazi Party is, was mobilized style. Immobilized symbol, immobilized architecture, immobilized songs, immobilized myth. Adolf Hitler was an artist, and he might have failed like sketching it's stuff. And his art, and his art yeah. is pretty crappy, actually. But he was brilliant on a, in a different medium, and the medium was power. Um, the Nazi movement was deeply, deeply invested in aesthetics, deeply invested in creativity. And it was part of the strategy of the Nazi party from its early days trying to upset power in Germany to its days of consolidating powers in Germany. Uh, just so they, were, they were masters of, of staging a spectacle and, and thinking about how things are presented for cameras and film. Um, they also understood style. They had yeah. incredibly detailed different outfits um, the SS uniform was designed by a team of an artist and a graphic designer and produced at what would become the factory of, the, of Hugo Boss. Which, by the way, also produced the um, outfits for Miami Vice. So you yeah. can make that what you will. Uh, but I think it's like an interesting fact. 
And you know, when we look around at, at, at right-wing movements, you see, again, the effective use of spectacle and symbol. Uh, and we could go on about this. I mean, there's, there's plenty of contemporary examples as and well. Used by the state. I mean, the stage management of George W. Bush landing on the uh, aircraft carrier and declaring mission accomplished, or the war strategies of like shock and awe, were really built as aesthetic strategies. Um, and bringing it back home, at least home to New York, is you know the bombing of the World Trade Centers uh, was a performative act. And in fact, who is that artist? The artist who does uh, it actually said it was a performance piece par excellence. Um, it was a piece of art. They thought about what to bomb, what to fly the planes into, in terms of its symbolic value. It had no military value, the Pentagon, the White House, and the World Trade Center, but it had symbolic value. And it conjured up all the images of every horror film that's ever been, or uh, uh, disaster film that's ever been produced. It was calculated. And if you look at the Islamic State, the beheadings, the videos of those beheadings, all of that is created with a creepy, macabre, aesthetic eye. So right. what are we saying? This is getting really dark. I know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm depressing myself. So, well, um, I think you've made your points that creativity can be very powerful. Um, but, you know, there's Whenever we talk about this, there's part of me that's like, yeah, this is dangerous stuff, right? Um, and, and like, maybe we should just back off of it. If it's so powerful and it can be used by these right-wing forces, like, what are we doing? Yeah, I mean, what creative activism does is it mobilizes the emotions. Um, and those emotions can be, and often are, the emotions of fear and hatred for the other. But what the civil rights movement shows us um, is that isn't the only emotions that could be mobilized. Things like care and love um, and the insistence on actually, you know, building a beloved community, which is what the civil rights movement put out as their ideal. That, too, is an emotional response, and we can build that through attention to aesthetics, performance, story, symbol, and spectacle, just as easily as terrorists, um, Nazi party, can use their spectacles, or Donald Trump today, and Steve Bannon, to fake cultivate news. hate and fear. Right. Like, fake news is another... It takes creativity. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, come on. What did you do with the Yes Men? You created yeah. fake news, dude. Yeah. You're to blame. You're to yeah. blame. Um, why, so, is, why, is, why is this? Why is Spider-Man here? Well, the way that I kind of resolve this, Steve and I ta remember talking about this a long time ago. By the way, we're almost wrapped up, so if you have questions, start start uh, start asking your questions and we can answer them. But um, I always think about the Spider-Man story, right? And um, when Spider-Man is, or Peter Parker is just discovering his powers, and he's kind of, I mean, he's a teenager, right? And so he's like, hey, wow, look, I can do all this stuff, and like, just sort of reckless about it. Um, his Uncle Ben gives him this advice. And he says, Peter, these are the years when a man changes into the man he's going to become for the rest of his life. Just be careful what you change into. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think these tools are very powerful, but it's our job to think about how to use them ethically and responsibly. It's about ethics. Always think to yourself, not always, will this work? But is it demonstrating the world that I want to bring into being? And I think uh, these tools do work, right? They, they are effective. And if we only leave them in the hands of the worst people in the world because they use them, we kind of like take away this very powerful ability that we have. And so, um, so we can't write off anything that's been used for, for bad things. So um, let's see. So again, yeah, we we have all these other examples. Maybe we'll do a part two to this someday. Yeah. We can talk about some of those other examples. If people want a part two, let us know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but basically, the idea you can go back and think about historic movements, and we do this in our workshops with groups of people, where it's like we we ask them to think about things from their history, the stories that they're told. It doesn't have to be like Howard's in people's history stuff. It can be what you were taught in elementary school. 
But when you go back and look at it, you'll see that there is um, uh, a, a creative element to everything that has worked, right? So when we talk about, we look at like the feminist movement, we look at the American Revolution, and you know, you saw the list, like it includes like religious leaders and stuff. And, and it's, it's tricky because we, we only know these things historically. But when you look at, say, the American Revolution, there was this use of uh, drama and, and uh, the Tea Party. I mean, the yeah. Tea Party is it is a stage spectacle. There is no reason to do what they're doing except that it performs a great spectacle, and then a spectacle which is reproduced over and over and over again on things like etchings and then on stamps, and it becomes this huge sort of symbol of independence. So, um, so anyway, when you look back at history, you'll, you'll find these bits of innovation and bits of creativity. And, and the idea is not to repeat them, but to learn the lessons from them. So okay. um, let's bring Rebecca back in, and we can start doing some of these questions. Um, let's see, Rebecca, i got to get your camera back on. Yeah. Join us, Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Oh, you got to turn on your mic, too. Um, Hello. There hey. we go. So we have a question? Yeah, well, I wanted to mention a couple of people have said, yes, please do a part two. All right. Okay. And if you remember the list, you can actually pick. We could do a whole one just on the Abrahamic religions, Moses, Jesus, and the prophet Muhammad. I would love nothing more to do that. Do that. And I, as someone who's skeptical of those things, I will say that they're a lot more, they're a lot better than I thought they would be. <laughs> Is that fair? Sorry. I meant, yeah. to, I meant that to be polite. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> so, what are our questions? You got so, question? I have a question from Helms Gerald um, who asks There's a call for a new Poor People's Campaign. What tactics did they use before, and why didn't they work? And what do you think about reestablishing old campaigns rather than starting up something altogether different? Uh, that's a really great question. So the question always is: is like, do you actually want to drag up the signs and symbols of something which is old, um, or is it better to start absolutely new? And there's sort of pros and cons of both. Um, building on cultural foundations means that you actually can work with what people are familiar with, yet it also kind of can constrain you because that stuff carries a lot of baggage with it. And so it's really a case-by-case -case example. Um, the Poor People's Movement, uh, which I think it might be referring to, um, came out of the late 1960s, 1970s, uh, and was centered around welfare reform and so on and so forth. And I'm trying to remember what their sort of symbolic uh, repertoire was. And I hate to say it, but it may be that I can't remember because they never found an effective repertoire. Um, they didn't find the symbol. They didn't find the way to represent themselves in a way where people immediately understood what their politics were. Um, and I think that what I would say in that case is maybe if it was ineffective, that's not necessarily the place to go back to. But instead to think about at this moment and this time, what are the symbols that could be mobilized that would demonstrate the important politics of a poor people's movement for today? Um, I don't know what those would be, but probably people in the movement through a brainstorm would have some good ideas. I think that's the, the, the key idea, right? It's like that, that um, you wouldn't actually be repeating that campaign. Um, just like if I decide I was going to make somebody like take an old artwork and make it now, I really probably couldn't execute it the same way. Um, and so it, it is going to get updated. And it, I see it as connected to what we were talking about before of um, uh, how do we, uh, building on, cul on pre cultures that came before, you know what I mean? So like there's, Instead of creating a whole new language, like people under, might understand the Poor People's Campaign and it gives them a starting point, then you can build and modify on it. And in that way, I think it could work. And, and, and that we do need to draw on previous things or, that were successful or even unsuccessful and figure out why and take the parts that work, update, the other, update what needs updating, and improve the things that need improving. 
um, you know, why not? Well, what, and one thing I'd like to add on to that, it's a, it's a section of about the Black Panthers we didn't get time to get to, which is how their own symbol, um, which was the Black Panther, but also the militancy, um, was consciously used by the FBI and police forces as a way to undermine the Black Panther Party and set them up for things like assassinations. Um, and what that always tells us is that symbols themselves can have their meaning changed at any time. Um, that it's always contested terrain as to what a symbol actually means. And so by mobilizing a symbol, you always have to be careful about what are the meanings that it has and what are the meanings that an enemy of my movement could sort of put onto them and so they could be read in a different way. I don't know, that's, I don't know if that makes sense. Steve, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, it, makes, it makes more sense when we do it with pictures. So I'm wondering, Rebecca, do we have any other questions we want to do? Does anybody have any other questions? We don't. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't know yeah. you might. We, um, yeah, we don't have more questions. There's just more calls for part two. All right. Well, I think Wait, it's time to wrap it up. We will do part two. Maybe Sorry, I just yeah. saw one. Um, the way that people consume images today is very different than we did in the 1960s. We see so many things, and nothing right. has staying power. How should artistic activism respond? Oh, that is a great question. I mean, we are bombarded. There's no Life magazine where the civil rights movement could get eight photos in it, and it would go across the entire world. That is an amazing question. Um, what are things? What? Sorry, I'll let you think for a second because I have a first thought. Is yeah. one is that um, it, it's even more needed, right? Because we have to compete. It's not that. Um, like and, and there there are ways that you can get through. It just it it takes a more uh, polished and thought through uh, sense of aesthetics in order to be effective, and that's why artists are especially can be especially good at this, right? We can, I mean the 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 yeah they can be good at it. The problem is when we get too stuck in our little circle of art history and the and the and the symbols and stuff that go along with like what protest was like Russian constructivist posters or things that like um, have this aesthetic that's 30 years old that artists think are really cool but doesn't resonate with the rest of the culture but we are capable of making things that resonate with the larger culture and um, and cutting through um, a lot of things that are just out there to uh, to make a profit or to sell you something or to persuade you to, to buy something like that that key difference I think is how people um, it, it gets people's attention, sincerity, something where you're not trying to sell them something, but you actually care about this. Like, yeah. that's what cuts through in this culture. What yeah. do you think? Yeah, I like that. Um, the first thing I was going to say is just you have to think about multi-platforms. Um, and this is what the Civil Rights Movement did. It had comedy shows. It had music. It had uh, images. It had all the sorts of things. But I like where Steve was going with that at the end. It may be that in the day of the in the, in this world of the image and of fake news and ironic news and satirical comedy that actually what's needed is authenticity and person to person authenticity that actually super low tech performance which is the performance of authenticity I know it sounds paradoxical but it takes a lot of skill and planning to create situations in which authenticity can flourish. Um, and I think maybe that would cut through, is kind of do something different. Or to coin, uh, to, to borrow from Apple, you know, think different. Oh, God. <laughs> Steve says stuff sometimes just to piss me off. <laughs> So um, we're about out of time. I saw that question from Lisa, Rebecca. Thank you for pointing that out, the women, about the Women's March in Washington. Oh, can I talk about that? Women's March. Yeah, sure. I was going to okay. go ahead. This is a moment when there is so much to draw upon from previous women, women's marches. And there's these incredible, spectacular women's marches around the right for women to vote, where, where they all wear white, they're on horses, and do a little research about women's marches, and there's such 
interesting stuff that one could play with because it's such a rich pageantry. And I mean yeah. pageantry quite literally. Um, I'll also say uh, there, there was an article a couple weeks ago in the Times about the art of protest that I'll, I'll make sure goes out with the email um, for this workshop um, that you'll get in a sec, or uh, sorry, in, in a few hours after this. Um, and it might, it might be helpful um, in thinking about that. So um, we have a couple things here at the end. Um, one is thank you for joining us. We really appreciate that you're interested in this and your attention and, and um, we hope it's helpful. We have a sort of evaluation survey that's gonna go out with an email that you'll get later today. Um, and we just ask that you fill it out. It'll help us get a sense of how these are working, what people want. We, we're, we're, we've been able to be very responsive, so we look at the surveys and then sort of figure out what the next few webinars will be based on that. The other thing is you'll, be, you'll get a link to register for the next one. The next one is um, not going to be next Friday because Steve and I are actually going to be in Dublin working with uh, sex workers and sex work advocates on decriminalization efforts there, and we're, um, we'll be there all week. So the next one, I think, is on, a, on the Wednesday, the week after it. Like Wednesday, not a, yeah, you'll get the date uh, in that email. But sign up. Even if you can't be there in person, you'll get the emails, and you'll get the video afterwards. We'll also post this on the site, and you'll get that link. And one final thing, which is we're funding this out of our pocket. Um, and so if you enjoy it, if you think it's a worthwhile endeavor, think about you know buying us a cup of coffee. And obviously you can't do that, but you can contribute the amount of what a cup of coffee would cost. Or maybe buy us lunch, um, or buy us dinner, or say take us out to a really fancy dinner and try to get us drunk. Um, think about, you know, there's all different levels of, of this, you know. Uh, because essentially what we're trying to do is have a conversation, a one-sided conversation, I'd be it but the type of conversation that might happen over a cup of coffee or over lunch or over a really boozy dinner. Um, now, I'll just add that we are not going to spend the money on coffee or dinner or booze. No, no. It'll we'll go towards to these programs. And it, will, it will go to paying for this webinar software. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so keep an eye out for that email. Please sign up for the next ones. If you want to go back and watch the others, um, they're online. We're doing this all for free. And um, again, thank you. We really appreciate you joining us, um, and we look forward to the feedback we get from you. Yeah. Rebecca, Thank you. you got anything to add? Just one thing. Um, oh, somebody mentioned... boys. oh, sorry. Hey. Um, <laughs> somebody mentioned that they would love to have a list of books or links related to everything wow. that you've just been talking about, and I think we have some of that on our website, but I think we'll point people to it in the follow-up email. Great. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. All right, everybody. Toodaloo.